Hi, Amy Collins from Free Advice Friday. It is July 3rd, and I am here with a whole bunch of very hardy souls who are kicking off their July 4th weekend, those of us in the States. Those of you up in Canada, you're ending, you're ending your, uh, your Canada Day celebrations this weekend, I know. And for those of you outside of North America, God bless you. I wish I was one of them. I'm, I'm, having, I'm having a rough a rough time right now uh, where we are with everything going on, but it's so good to see you all. I have a number of questions that were emailed in this week. I want to remind you guys, and I'm going to put it in the chat box, that our email address, if you want to send us questions during the week, is questions at freeadvicefridays.com. It used to be questions at amysadvice.com, and I will try and get that email back, but right now, we have actually gotten the trademark and the brand for Free Advice Fridays. So we are questions at freeadvicefridays.com. That is where to find us. Also, I would beg of you, I strongly ask you to go to freeadvicefridays.com. Click on the tab, the button that says subscribe to our YouTube channel. I would love it if you would subscribe to our YouTube channel. We are moving everything over to Free Advice Fridays so that it's its own channel. And we're gonna be doing a lot of little mini interviews. It's gonna be a terrific channel. Everything that you guys have come to know for the channel you're already subscribed to at Amy Collins. But if you would go to freeadvicefridays.com and subscribe to our YouTube channel, that would really help us out because the minute we get 100 subscribers, and we have thousands of subscribers on, on the old site, but if we can get 100 subscribers on the new site, we can port everything over, and that would be awesome. All right. All right, well, good morning, Tara. Good morning, Anna. Good to see all of you. Let's get started with the questions. Uh, Randy is, um, is, is kicking us off. He, he asked the first question, and he's been emailing a number of questions. Now, Randy is taking my library course, and so he and I have been working a little bit on his materials. And Randy, I owe you a call. We should get back on the phone next week and because some of these questions are very specific to you. But he's finalizing his marketing materials to start rocking the library market. And he had a number of questions about what to include. So what I'd like to start by telling you guys is if you've taken my courses or if you've watched old videos of mine, you heard me say that librarians prefer PDF. Don't send a Word document, don't send anything. Send a PDF because they're safe. However, in the last six months, eight months, things have changed dramatically and I need to, I need to change some of those videos in my classes and I need to take down that advice from older videos that I've recorded for you guys because things have changed. What I am recommending now is that if you put a packet together, Put it all together in one PDF. Combine all the pages. Do not send separate pages. If you've got seven sheets, if you've got a, an informative one sheet and you've got a pretty cover sheet about the author and you've got a, a marketing sheet, you know, a gorgeous, you know, mar and Randy, I sent you some templates for those marketing sheets about your entire series or your all three books or whatever. And you've got a press release and you've got a marketing plan that's four or five pages long, I would strongly recommend that you put them all in a PDF and you put them on your website to download. Step number one, put them on your website to download. If you don't know how to do that, then get a book, uh, a book funnel account, bookfunnel.com. You know, it allows you to put uh, PDFs up for download but get the PDF up on your website so that it can be downloaded and send an email to the librarians with embedded screenshots of the, the, the gorgeous marketing sheet, um, the, the about the author sheet. But what I do now is I embed them actually as HTML into my emails. The reason is librarians are not, and no one is at this, about opening attachments from people they don't know. A PDF is safe, so if you're going to reach out to a librarian and you don't know how to embed or you really can't figure it out, then embedding one PDF package is much better than sending 27 or 15 or even six attachments. Uh, we have found that the open rate is much higher when it's one PDF and when you, when you call it the, you know, name it the name of your publisher, the name of your publisher, you know, marketing kit. 
But what we've done is we put the cover letter right in the email now and we embed the sheets below so that as they scroll down, they can just see them. And, and in the cover letter, you can say, if you would like to download a PDF of this, feel free to um, you know, click on this link and download it from my website. But a number of librarians and a number of libraries, they're not allowed, their, their systems won't allow them to click on unfamiliar links. So also give them the option of responding to you and say, if you would like a PDF of this, I'd be happy to mail it to you. And so just you know, email me back and I will send you this as a downloadable PDF. The reason why I am now suggesting, Randy, that you do not actually include PDFs in your email if you can help it, is that more and more we are finding that libraries in particular, that the emails are bounced back, that libraries are not, that they, librarians don't even see the emails. The library firewalls will block any unknown emails from someone with attachments. They just do it out of hand. Not all libraries, but enough of them. So that is a very long explanation as to what you can and what you should include in the emails. And it has all changed. So I'll be redoing videos in the next week or two to discuss that. But that is in detail. If you've got your one sheet, if you've got your marketing sheet, if you've got your about the author sheet, you've got your marketing plan, press release, and if you have a cover letter, that should all go into the body of the email and no longer as an attachment. But do make it available for download. Uh, Randy's also asking if he needs a separate one sheet for the audio book, um, since a different person at the library deals with those. If so, does he include it with others? Uh, Randy, I'd just make it part of your kit. You know, put right at the top, you know, audio book. Um, but I would also include the ISBN, I, truthfully, for most of you, unless you're going to be pitching specifically your audio book exclusively or very aggressively, it is, for most of you guys, it is fine to just put in your, your informational sheet and on your marketing sheet, paperback ISBN, hardcover available ISBN, ebook available as an EPUB ISBN, ebook available as a Kindle ISBN, and audiobook available and that ISBN. You don't need to come up with a separate sheet. Now, Randy, for your particular situation, if you want to get really aggressive with it, it's fine to do it. It's no big deal. You already have the sheet created. Just copy it and, and put audiobook at the top with the ISBN. Um, yes, it, including uh, brochures are all fine. Just make it all part of one packet. All right, so I hope that that answers the, the general questions. Randy, we can set up a call next week to answer your more specific questions, but I hope that that was helpful. All right, Linnea, you didn't get any sleep either? Oh, man. And Sonia, I love your answer. Love it. Vicki, how are you? Happy 4th as well. Um, stay safe out there in Arizona. All right, let's answer some of the questions that are coming in here online. Um, I'm just going to go through it. Oh, Bob Eckstein is here. Good morning, Bob. Always good to see you. Let me just read this quietly to make sure. Let's see. Oh, okay. Bob is shopping a book proposal for an illustrated novel that includes a full manuscript and 10 drawn pages. He received interest from one small publisher, but he didn't hear from the handful of submissions that he sent out to the bigger houses. Um, but one of the biggest houses said they'd love to see the book when he completed the whole thing, when he gets a chance. Uh, well, for one thing, Bob, um, if you're doing this outside of your agent, um, uh, we'll, we'll talk about that. But um, uh, if the bigger house is saying they'd love to see the book when they completed the whole thing, um, I would absolutely... I would absolutely uh, send them the full manuscript with the 10 drawn pages you have. Um, if you haven't already sent it to them and say that you will, you know, that you're happy to complete the whole thing and that you are, you're working on that, but that you're already getting some interest and some offers from interest from, uh, you know, other publishers. And so if they would like to present this to PubBoard, um, here's, you know, 10 illustrations as well as the full manuscript. Um, if I, I can't imagine, I don't know many editors who would require someone of your pedigree and with your background to actually complete every single illustration. And as you said, you've got a full manuscript. So it is done for the most part. 
Um, and then Bob said, that's exactly what he did, but now they want to see the whole thing. Well, then they may lose out. Um, keep pursuing the other publishers. Keep go. And when you finish the book, if you don't have, um, if you don't have, if you're not in negotiations with another publisher, then send it back to them. But um, it sounds like, you know, they're, they want you to do a great deal of work without putting any skin in the game themselves. And that's fine if you, if you weren't as famous, as talented, as successful as you are. At your level, I would suggest you keep pitching. I would pitch hard to several publishers and just keep going with what you have. Finish the book at your own pace. If nothing has come of it by the time the book is done, then you can go back to that editor. But um, I wouldn't rush it or certainly wouldn't skip over some of the smaller or medium-sized houses that truthfully right now are giving authors a lot more attention than, um, than some of the bigger guys. I hope that was helpful. If not, um, I'm happy to, to go more in detail about some of my brief experiences with pub boards. But um, the pub board world is changing right now. So many of them are virtual. So many of them are being done uh, no longer in the same room. A lot of the houses are changing what they require because their, their financial situations are looking really grim for the fall. So if you're pitching to publishers, um, all the rules are up in the air at the moment. But that is my, that is my, uh, my 10 seconds uh, answer. But uh, Bob, you know, I am always here for you. If you need anything, um, I can go deeper. Denise is asking, if you run a three-day free promo on KDP, should you also run an ad campaign on Amazon around the same time? No, 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 no. Um, Denise, what you should do, I, I, I feel strongly about this. If you're running a three-day free promo on KDP, you should absolutely spend some advertising money, but not on Amazon. There are some terrific sites out there, and um, we actually have a blog about this that Carrie Barnum wrote. If you go to newshelves.com slash blog, um, and just type in the word Kindle. I wish I had the link here, but I'll, I'll find it. Um, I'll, I'll make it available to you at some point. But Denise, go to newshelves.com slash blog. In the search bar, just type the word Kindle, and you will find a blog very quickly that Carrie Barnum wrote that lists all of her favorite sites where to promote free and low-cost ebook promotions. Um, uh, Kindle freebie, and you know, there's a whole bunch of sites out there that if you're going to spend a little, and they're not expensive, some of them are $5, some are $20, a couple of them are 100 but what I would recommend is, str I strongly recommend you do not spend money with Amazon ads if you're offering a free deal, but you do promote it to sites such as Kindle Freebie and some of the places where people have subscribed. It's their version of, of BookBub. If you have the money in your budget to do a BookBub promotion, to get a featured listing, if you're going to be offering your book for free for a few days, then I would absolutely apply uh, to BookBub, see if you can get an approval, and then schedule your three-day around whatever dates they give you. Because you can, they, if they give you dates, that's golden. That is how to spend your marketing dollars when you do freebie, not with Amazon ads. All Amazon ads are going to do is cost you per click, and you won't make anything back. Uh, Randy, w let's get into the the nitty gritty. But you're saying full size screenshots. I, that's not exactly how embedding emails work. When you embed an email, and when you embed a, a document or an image into an email, it it grows and shrinks to the width of whatever email. Like if you're on your phone, it's it's a certain size. If you're on the computer, it depends. I mean, I've got a 27 inch monitor right here that I'm using, not to brag, but I have a 27 inch monitor. Um, other people have a 14 inch monitor. So they're all full size isn't really how that works, but I'm happy to, to walk you through it. Sonia, I have never used StreetLib for distribution. I'm sorry, I don't know anything about them, but I will write them down and I will absolutely look them up for next week. StreetLib distribution. I don't even know who they are. I'll be honest with you. All right, Pat is asking. If considering self-publishing a children's picture book, picture book, or chapter book, what would be your top three marketing strategies or platforms for a newbie author? All right, Patricia, Pat, um, how, however you like to be referred to, um, there's a couple of things that I'd keep in mind if I was self-publishing a children's book. The first is, and I need to let you know this, 
If you're going to go print on demand, you're going to have a really hard time. She'll, the, one of the, you didn't ask this, but one of the top three marketing strategies that I'd come up with is to make sure you have the money to print the books, at least a small print run, maybe a thousand to start, beautifully uh, with a, a real printer, not a digital printer, you know, an offset printer. Get them printed. Maybe you, you go overseas. But one of the first things and the best things you can do for the sales and marketing success of your book for a children's book or a cookbook or anything that does four color is you might want to consider avoiding print on demand. Print on demand is fantastic. I love it. It's not quite there yet for children's books. The paper isn't quite right. The depth of color, the, um, the, the ability to print on the spine, the, um, the hardcover quality, uh, if you're going to be publishing, if you're going to start a children's publishing line where you're doing picture books and chapter books and maybe I mean, board books, they come and go in terms of popularity. Board books are extremely popular. You please consider printing perhaps overseas because marketing a print on demand children's book is extremely difficult. I would argue that in all of my years, I have not seen a truly successful, strictly print on demand children's book. I've seen many, many successful children's books that printed print on demand and offset that had kind of a, a, a one to two hybrid deal. But the first thing I would suggest is you make sure that your packaging was pristine. Make sure it's perfect. So then uh, the second thing I would suggest is for kids books, it's all about word of mouth recommendations and reviews. Do not publish your book until you have at least a dozen famous, successful, uh, other authors, but you have people raving about your book, telling you what they think of it. So create some what's called F and G's, fold and gathers. They're, they're sheets that you send out to people and, and start with reviews. With a children's book in particular, you're going to want a school library journal or a publisher's weekly or a book list or, um, I mean, there's, an, or, or go to some of the parenting magazines, but you're going to have to have reviews. Children's books are not like a number of other types of books where, you know, simply by the strength of, of your personality and, and what a great writer you are, you, you, you rise to the top. Children's books is all about people want to hear from someone they know and they trust that your book is good. So quality has to be 100%, including printing and ink and everything. Paper has to be gorgeous. You have to get reviews. You have to get reviews. You, you cannot skip that. So putting a children's book out in September of this year isn't a great idea. My number one, my number two marketing suggestion is you make sure that you, you go through the four to five month review process. That, that is required by all of the top houses. Find the magazines where other famous and well-known children's books have been reviewed and submit your book there. And the other big thing is get famous and well-known people. Um, if, you're, if you have any marketing dollars, then use it with them to get them to recommend your book. It's about word of mouth, it's about reviews, and it's about quality. Children's books, you will notice, I haven't even talked about how gorgeous the writing is. I'm afraid with children's books right now that there are so many talented, well, well done, well written children's books. And there's so many out of this world, unbelievable illustrators out there that a quality book, that's, I mean, that's your ante in, that's your 50 cents on the table. You're at a high stakes game here. You are, you are gambling with tens of thousands of dollars and having a quality book all that is is the if that's the first dollar on the table just to get into the game that everyone expects your book to be quality everything else has to be top notch and until you have the endorsements testimonials reviews and the the quality printing heft in your hand i am afraid that printing or publishing a children's book it's too soon Sorry to go to, to go on and on and on about that. Let's see what's going on here in the chat box. Make sure I'm not missing anything. Um, bum, bum, bum. Uh, let's see. Nancy, how are you? It's so good to see you. I, um, I always love seeing you. Hey, Sue, great to see you. 
Uh, Mary is asking if I know an excellent person to hire for social media coverage. Mary, I would be happy to make some recommendations. We have a couple of them on our website. If you go to freeadvicefridays.com slash people we like, or just go to freeadvicefridays.com, you'll see at the top, there's a button that says people we like. I have a couple of social media people there that I have personally used. Nobody shows up on that page until I have used them. And I mean, everyone on that page is someone that I know. Nobody buys their way onto that page. Nobody just gets on there on the side. It's not how it works. So I have some, depending on what you need for social media, um, there are a couple of people who I know and love who will do social media for authors. I'm not a big fan of that. I believe you should be doing your own. Um, Carrie at New Shelves does a great job with social media. I love the work that she, I mean, she took it over from me years ago. I, I haven't even touched social media since. I recommend her. But there's some, depending on what you need, if you need someone to do it for you, I've got a couple of names for you. And if you want someone to teach you how to do it or to kind of get you up and running, uh, you might want to call Carrie or email her, Carrie at New Shelves. Um, she's, she and her team do great job, but other people do as well. So they're all listed there at people we like. Uh, 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 freeadvicefridays.com. Freeadvicefridays.com. Go to people we like, the whole list there. Hey, Tara, good morning. Love the new haircut. Got to tell you, big fan, but I liked it before. Um, hmm. Mary is saying she has library course questions. Okay. Mary, here's the deal. Have you and I had, if, if you took the library course, have we had your hour of consulting? Because everyone who signs up for the course gets an hour of one-on-one -on -one time with me. Make sure that you email me. Just email me, amy at newshelves, amy at newshelves.com, and we'll set up a time to get your, your questions um, answered. Let's see. Um, I'm just checking real quick these, these chats to make sure. Suzanne is saying that her local bookstore told her that they don't carry self-published books. And working with Ingram Sparks, does that help get over the, the hurdle? Suzanne, let me give you my experience. I can't give you um, a, the, the honest to goodness, 100% stamped approved. I mean, I can't tell you that this is 100% true, but I can give you my experience. 99% of the time, and I have been calling publishers, I have been working with self-published authors, and I have been working with bookstores and libraries for almost 30 years. And when a bookstore says to an author, we do not take self-published books, what they are saying, I'm so sorry, Suzanne, what they're saying is we don't want to take your book. Of course, bookstores and libraries take self-published books. Um, if you look at the stats, according to the Book Industry Study Group, over 70% of the books that sold last year through the bookstore market, 70% of them were from traditional houses. So let's do the math. If, 70, if it was 71% of, of books that sold through the bookstore market were from traditional midsize or, or large houses, and 30%, and it's broken up, like 5% are self-published and 9% were independently published. By the way, guys, independent publishers, for the most part, for the most part, is just a clever way of masking being self-published. Now, there are small and medium-sized houses like Emerald Lake, like Tara has, which are not you know, self-published authors. They are their official real publishing houses. But 30% of the books that were sold through the bookstores last year were not through traditional houses. Most of them were self-published. So if you're being told by your bookstore or your library that they don't take self-published book, either they don't like your book or it's not distributed properly. They won't take your book on consignment because they don't like the look of it. They don't think they can sell it. And it is so much easier to say to someone, oh, sorry. We have a policy. The policy is we don't take self-published books. That is a much kinder way, and it keeps people from arguing. No, you can't argue with a policy. You don't take self-published books. It's not my book. Okay. But let's say, Suzanne, that your book is stunning and that they really wanted to carry it, but it's not available through Ingram or through any of their wholesalers. Then, yes, go through Ingram Spark. Getting your book distributed through Ingram Spark, where it's returnable, so, and you have to give Ingram Spark their full 53 to 55% discount. 
Because if you give Ingram Spark anywhere from 53 to 55% discount, they can sell the book to their sister company, Ingram, at a 53% discount. Ingram can turn around and sell the book to the bookstores at a 35 to 40% discount. They keep the 10 or 15 points in between. And that pays for the gas and the trucks and the shipping and the employees and the customer service and the billing. And then the bookstore gets a 40% discount, which they've always gotten. That's what they deserve. They're the ones who are going to put your books on the shelf. They have to pay their rent or their mortgage and their lights and their employees. So if you want to get into bookstores, a fully returnable discount at Ingram Spark, discounted to wholesalers between 53 and 55% may do the trick. I hope that answers your question. Um, Jules is asking, what is a pub board? Oh, okay. A pub board, for anyone who, I, I probably should have explained that, for anyone who was listening to my answer with Bob about getting an agent or, or pitching to a, a traditional publisher, this is how in many, many cases publishing works, in most cases, this is how it works. You pitch your book to an agent, and let's say the agent takes on, um, it says, okay, I'll take you on. Yeah, or, or you don't, you do it yourself, but somebody pitches your book to an acquisition editor at a publisher. And it is the agent's job or your job, who's ever pitching your book, to convince the acquisition editor that your book could be very successful and make their company a lot of money. Then it's the acquisition editor's job to go to their boss, the executive, uh, executive editor, or the head of the editorial department, their boss, and they need to convince their boss that this book idea that you've pitched them will make their company a lot of money. And then the executive, ed the editorial director, and in most cases, the acquisition editor, go to pub board. And the pub board is usually made up of a, a whole team of people from different parts of the company. The art director is there, quite often the sales director is there, or several sales directors. If there's a trade director and a specialty director, maybe the library, the person who's representing the library market or corporate sales is there. And it's a whole, it's a whole table. In some cases, it's three or four people. In other cases, it's 10. In some cases, it's, it's huge. But, but let's say it's six people, just for the sake of argument. And that pub board meets once a week, twice a month. Um, in most of my experiences, it was once a week, but things are changing now with everything going on. And the pub, and so the editor, then it's their job to convince the pub board that this book idea, that if this book gets accepted, it will make the publisher a lot of money. It will be successful. You have to tell the pub board how hard the author is willing to work to promote it. You have to get a comp title and comparative title data. You know, there are other books that are similar but aren't exactly the same thing. There's actually room on the shelf for this particular idea, but there's something similar that's already successful. Um, they have to weigh in. The art director has to say, yeah, I think, I think I could work that, you know, these illustrations or this idea. I like it. The sales director says, okay, I, I think I could sell this. But if, if the editor convinces the pub board that the book is worth publishing, then quite often the head of the department will give the acquisition editor the green light to go ahead and offer the agent or the pub or the, the author to make a deal, to make an offer. I'll give you $3,000 advance, I'll give you a $30,000 advance, I'll give you a $300,000 advance and 7% royalty for that book. And then the negotiations start. At that point, pub board is out of it. Um, as the negotiations go back and forth, they don't usually get, they don't get involved with that again, for the most part. Um, and then, you know, that's just the beginning. But pub board might, it, it's part of the step along, it's a very important step along the process so that you can get an offer. And, and that's what pub board is. I hope that helps. All right. Robert is saying, before the COVID-19 lockdown, I sold a library marketing which because U.S. libraries were closed became pointless. What is the status of the library mailing as of today? Robert, I am so sorry if you didn't get the updated emails. We've been sending them out, so I need to find you. Um, let me write that down because we started mailing out those mailings the first week in June. Um, so Robert, um, you should have been receiving, I mean, I, I know who you are, I know your book, um, and you're in the mailings. We have been sending them out um, all through June. However, an email was sent out last Thursday to everyone saying, guys, 
it's not working. It's just not working. I am sending out charming, well-written, gorgeous emails to the library market, and we are having such a low open rate. Um, they, the, the open rates were much higher in March and April, actually, than they are now. I think it's because libraries have been told they cannot purchase right now. I don't know what's going on. So we are, we've, we've sent out a number of mailings, and we are giving everyone the option at this point um, to either hold, hold firm, and we will keep mailing out to libraries, and we will, we will stop for a couple weeks, and we'll start again, and we will keep mailing out for the rest of the year. Or get a hold of me, and I am happy to refund your money. We did not know that COVID was going to hit when we sold the library mailing. Um, if you've already been through the library mailing, I mean, if you already got your, if, I'm talking about the one that was, that was starting in June. If you got the one that went out in January and February, you're good. But I mean, you did great. We had great open rates for those. But the one that was coming out in June, um, we have been sending them out, but we've not been getting the love that we thought we would get, we hoped we'd get. Um, and so we will keep we will keep trying. We're sending out smaller emails. We're sending them out at different times. We're going to keep sending them out all the way through the summer into the fall. Or, um, I'm, Robert, I'm happy to refund your money. Uh, we didn't know. And so we'll do that. All right. Um, bum, bum, bum. Mary, I don't know what info at, um, I am so sorry, info at new shelves. Uh, for those of you who are trying to get a hold of me, if you need to get a hold of me, amy at newshelves.com. Info at newshelves.com, I'm so sorry, is a general mailbox and it goes to uh, a couple of our employees. And because of COVID and because New York State was shut down for so long, um, I am so sorry. I am sure that it's stuck in a backlog of emails that came March, April, May, and we're just, I am so sorry that you are still waiting for a reply, but you guys can always get a hold of me at Amy at New Shelves. Mary, you email me personally. I will answer you today, I promise. All right. Uh, Mary didn't get the mailings. Okay. Well, Mary, call me. Email me. We, we've got to chat. I, I really, I, um, I, we, will, we will talk in the next day or two, I promise. Okay. So back to your questions. Let's see what time it is. It is 1030. How's everyone doing? How am I doing? I, did I mention I didn't get any sleep last night? I might be talking really slow. I have no idea. So give me one second to take one quick sip of Diet Coke and then I'll be right back to your questions. Man, I think I better take a nap before I even think about getting on the motorcycle this afternoon. All right. Linda, good morning. Uh, Linda sent two 99 cent promos and uh, on one ebook. Do you think it's okay to do free promotion on books? I have two other books that I want to promote as well as this one. Let me give you guys my 30 to 80 second overview on low cost and free ebooks. I do not want books, your books in particular, devalued. Selling your book as if you were an unknown author your ebook at $4.99 to $6.99 for fiction. And Linda, I know one of your books is memoir, but some of them are fiction. Selling your fiction books, if you're an unknown author at this point, anywhere from $4.99 to $6.99, for the most part, if you, again, there are always exceptions, but that is where I would start. And I would be very careful and very judicious about offering your book for 99 cents or $1.99 I would, I would really do it at most once a year. And I would do it only in conjunction with a very large, very well-financed, it will cost you four or $500 ad campaign that, that sits around all of those, those companies I was telling you that Carrie listed for the, um, you know what, I may put those, those companies on people we like as well, but uh, Linda, I'll, I'll get that list to you. But doing a 99 cent promo or a $1.99 promo without a BookBub featured listing, I don't see the point. Or at least getting the, the, um, you know, the, the Kindle library and the librarian and the um, Booksy and all the, you know, getting the other promotions. Rebecca's getting, getting some promotion out. Just offering the book a low cost and doing your own promotion through social media 
all you're going to do is tell people who already have either bought your book or decided um my um hold on my eye watch is um is is my siri is thinking i'm talking to her whoops um well that's embarrassing uh so doing any sort of discount and then promoting it just to your own list you're promoting to a group of people who either have bought your book or have already decided not to buy your book uh it's in britain they call it drinking your own bath water uh, if you're going to lower the cost of a book, do it no more than once a year, only do it for a few days and make sure you advertise it. Try to get a BookBub featured listing, get the money together, spend the eight, $900. Because if you get a BookBub featured listing, you will make the money back in almost all cases. It is a great investment. And if you don't get the listing, there's lots of other sites like BookBub. They, they don't have quite the success, but you'll sell a couple hundred copies. It'll be awesome. So that is my take on eBooks. I am not a fan of free eBooks. I, um, I think that a free eBook only makes sense if you have a, in most cases, if you have a series and if you're trying to get someone's attention so that they buy the whole series, offering one of the books for free, the first one in particular makes sense or putting your first book on Kindle Unlimited and then making the rest broad. That would be, that would be my advice for that. All right, let me get to a couple more emailed questions. Let's see what we have here. Linnea, good morning. I know you're on this morning. It's good to see you. Apparently, you didn't sleep either, and I'm, I'm sorry. Um, I have rarely stayed up all night staring at the ceiling, but not fun. Linnea's saying, if the Donahue Group does the PCIP, some of you guys may know that I love Pat and her whole group, the Donahue Group. I like other PCIP providers, but the, the Donahue Group, they, they have a, the in with the MARC database and they're coded in, they're approved by the Library of Congress. They know their stuff. So if the Donahue Group does the PCIP, does that get the book listed in books in print? No. Or does it have to be separately through Bowker? Getting your book listed properly through books in print is very important and has nothing to do with the PCIP. Two very separate things. I would strongly recommend if you're a US citizen, that you go to myidentifiers.com, log in, or if you don't, I'm assuming that you have a login because you would have had to buy your ISBNs from them. And go check out your ISBN listings. Did, is the 10 ISBNs you bought, and let's say you've used three of them, do they look empty in my identifiers? Or did you go in and did you fill out all those forms? Did you tell them the title and what the trim size was? Did you upload the cover? Did you upload the interior? Did you do any of these things? Because if you did not, that means that your books and print listing is lacking. And it is very important that you go into your Bowker listing through myidentifiers.com. RR Bowker, their, their portal, their interface, with publishers is myidentifiers.com. Let me jot that into the chat box because that is an important myidentifiers.com. I hope I spelled that right. Um, because making sure that every single one of your ISBNs has every question answered, that is the best way to get the most rich and useful metadata out into the world. And it is really important for those of you who have not published a book yet to get all that metadata in before you publish the book. If your book's already published, it's not ideal, but I still want you to go back there and upload the cover and upload everything and get it done. Because getting your book into books in print um, gets you into more than books in print. That is a database that gets uploaded and flowed out into all sorts of databases. You have, I mean, you, you have no idea where that data ends up and it needs to be done properly. Jules is asking who I recommend for PCIP. Jules, they're called the Donahue Group. And uh, if you go to freeadvicefridays.com and click on people we like, they're listed there, but they're D-G-I-I-N-C.com, D-G-I-I-N-C.com, which stands for Donahue Group something incorporated, but then I-N-C.com. So go there, um, but go to people we like, um, you'll get the link. Uh, now again, that's only one company, but the, it, whomever you hire, to do your PCIP codes, make sure that they have access to and permission to upload your data to the MARC, M-A-R-C, the all caps, the MARC database. 
you want your book information up on OLC, um, OCLC, the WorldCat, and lots of people will give you a block, but all that means is that you, they just stuck a block on your copyright page. You want a company who can actually get their coding into all the library databases. For those of you who are confused about all of this, I'm, I'm gonna shut down the questions about PCIPs because we have a fantastic overview that we wrote up on our blog. If you go to newshelves.com slash blog and just in the search bar type PCIP, there is a whole blog that lists out in detail the Library of Congress information, Library of Congress numbers, pre-control numbers, PCIP, CIP, it talks about all these initials, what they stand for and what they're good for. I've got it all laid out for you. All right. Randy is asking, Kirkus Reviews, their website lists the paid option, but that's not the kind that libraries care about. Wow, yeah, I am with you. Randy, no. Uh, anyone who's known me for 10 minutes knows that do not, I tell, I beg of you, do not sign up for a Kirkus Discoveries review. Do not pay the $450 or whatever it is. Yes, there is a link and it's hidden. It is so hard to find, but there is a way to get to the Kirkus page where, um, a Kirkus page where you can, uh, I'm gonna try and multitask here, where you can get the instructions on how to submit to Kirkus without you know, actually submitting to their educational department, their editorial department. Holy moly, I am losing my mind. I can't, I'm not a good multitasker, especially on very little sleep. So let me see if I can find that link and drop it in the chat box for you. Book review sites to help you get into libraries and stores. I have a blog. It is called Book Review Sites to Help You Get Into Libraries and Stores. And I am dropping it into the chat box right now. And I'm so glad I found it. Um, let's see. There we go, Randy. If you click on that link, I have the instructions on how to submit to Publishers Weekly, to Kirkus, without, without having to go, because you're right, Kirkus pretty much hides. They don't want self-published authors submitting to their editorial team. Uh, they want them to pay the 450. But there is a way around it. Editors and publishers from major houses know how to submit to Kirkus. And if you click on that link, you will too. There's the instructions. They're all right there. Anna's saying that her distribution platforms include Amazon, Ingram Spark, and Draft to Digital. Uh, Anna, unless you have an audiobook, and I, I can't imagine you do about the deer, but if you have an audiobook, um, then yes, you should uh, you should probably include find away voices in your distribution model but other than that you look good to me you look absolutely golden uh wendy's asking how to get on an email list about information on libraries wendy i'm so sorry i don't understand the question um how do i get on the email list about information on libraries uh, Wendy, I'm happy to put you on my newsletter list, but um, we give information about a bunch of things. If you're talking about taking the Real Fast class that Daniel Hall offers, um, you just go to realfastlibrarymarketing.com slash amyspecial. realfastlibrarymarketing.com slash amyspecial will give you some information about the class that I teach, but that's Daniel's. Daniel runs it. I'm just the teacher. Um, so that, but if you're asking about how to get on our newsletter, um, I'll happily sign you up. Okay, let me answer another question from the email and then I'll get back to your questions here. Let's see, Wendy H says, hi, Amy and Carrie, glad to have the internet. Well, we're glad you're back too, Wendy. Um, her ebook, Change Your Mind, Change Your Body. Sorry, Wendy, I have to put my glasses on. Ah, was it $6.99 and did pretty well. So she dropped it down to $4.99 to see if she'd get more sales. No, she didn't. I'm not surprised. $4.99 to $6.99, people do not, um, it does not matter to people. So after having given it a chance, she's going to put it back up to $6.99. Can I recommend a good price through Draft to Digital? Wendy, the, the price through Draft to Digital is $6.99. If that's what you put it up as, that, if that's what it should be everywhere across the board, except for Overdrive. See, if you're selling, when you go to draft to digital, 
you will notice that you are allowed to put the retail price in, which you've already decided is $6.99. And it should be the same for all retailers. Don't, don't play around, $6.99. But you are allowed and encouraged to set a different price for non-retail sales, for wholesalers, for people like Overdrive that will be making your book available to the libraries. And my rule of thumb for unknown authors who are either self-published or independently published, and my rule of thumb is twice. You know, so if you're $6.99, I sell it for $13, you know, or make it $14 at the most. Um, do not go higher than that until you've proven some demand. Now, if you have an enormous amount of demand, if you're selling a couple hundred copies every week of your ebook, then you can triple the price. But until that happens, until you've got some major demand, until the libraries are clamoring for your book, double it at the most. So it's $6.99, a $14 ebook. I'd say $13. I'd go to $13 if it were me. So that is my um, that is my two cents on that. Good morning, Jean. Let's see. It's nice to see you too, even though it's virtually. What is the difference between self-publishing and hybrid publishing? Ooh, Tara's on the question. She should answer that. Tara, are you still here? Let's see. Tara. Tara, is there any way that if I put you on, not on camera, I wouldn't do that to you, but can I open up your microphone so we can answer this question together? All right. Tara, good morning. How are you? Good morning, Amy. I'm doing fine. Thank you. Good. Jean, I'm going to answer this question in front of Tara, knowing that she is a traditional publisher and a hybrid publisher. She does both. Um, uh, or at least... My idea of what true hybrid publishing is. But I'm going to answer this question knowing that she's going to disagree with me. And we're going to fight in front of you guys. We're going to have a horrible knockdown, drag out fight in front of the children. But Tara and I are becoming friends. And I believe our friendship can, can handle it. Are you, good? you ready, Tara? Sounds good. My dukes are up. All right. Here is my, my take on self-publishing and hybrid publishing. My take is a self-publisher is an author, usually a first-time author, who has decided to publish their first book or their first one or two books on their own. They take on all of the elements themselves and they, and they, they hire a designer and they hire the editors and they truly self-publish. However, the industry, that is what I think of as self-publishing, but the industry has co-opted the term and self-publishing has become an overarching umbrella term. Um, okay, I'm gonna mix my metaphors, or a huge bucket, either an umbrella that protects us from the rain or a bucket that catches the rain. Horribly mixed metaphors. But self-publishing has become this enormous phrase that encompasses everything from predatory third-party vanity presses that charge you $80,000 to publish your grandfather's memoir, to truly independent publishing which is when, in my, my take, it's when a first-time author learns the ropes and decides to start their own publishing enterprise, and maybe the only books they're publishing are their own, but they're still being properly published. An independent publisher is a publisher who does not have the background of a traditional publisher or perhaps the hundreds of years experience behind them, but they're publishing properly. The books are being developed, edited, they're copy edited, they're laid out beautifully, they get a cover that matches what the marketplace asks for. The author is not in charge of deciding what goes in and out of the book, but the publisher is, and if it happens to be the same person, then at least they've got a team in place that will fight with them. But a true independent self-published book has every chance of becoming as big of a bestseller as any other book as a traditionally published book, which is where you sell the publishing rights to somebody and they take the publishing rights, you keep the copyright, but they make all the decisions and they pay you for the publishing rights and for every book sold. Then there's hybrid publishing. Hybrid publishing is a wonderful opportunity for, for um, independent authors or self-published authors who don't have the time, the energy, or the talent or expertise to get into design and editorial. I mean, I've been in publishing since the early 90s, and I wouldn't design my own cover. I wouldn't edit my own book. I, I, I wouldn't know what to do. So going to a hybrid publisher is, in many cases, where you actually partner with a 
a, a distributor or partner uh, with a publisher who has a distribution model. They've got editors, they've got designers, they've got a team and you, you co you coexist with them and you together, you publish the book. If you're smart, you will use a hybrid publisher that will fight with you and won't let you make your own decisions about your cover. If you're smart, you will hire a hybrid publisher that has zero or very few complaints from the Better Business Bureau that is you know, touted and loved by ALLI. There's some organizations, there's some uh, organizations out there that will tell you who the predators are. But one of the best hybrid publishers in my experience is Emerald Lake. And I'm not, I didn't even know Tara a couple weeks ago. But I mean, I don't get anything for saying this, but Tara, do you want to give your take on the difference between self-publishing and hybrid? Uh, yeah, you know, the analogy that I use is actually if, if you have a car that needs repairing. So say you've got this car, you drive it, you hear an odd noise. And, you know, you work with a dealership, you bought it from a dealership, the dealership is going to tell you when you have to get it serviced, how much you have to do, all these different things, and you have no real say in it if you want to maintain your manufacturer warranty. And that's a lot like your traditional publisher. The traditional publisher is telling you absolutely everything, they're in charge, they're in control. When you don't have the funds or don't want to play that game, you may go with the self-publishing route where it's a more, you can do great things with a limited budget, but it's more DIY. You need to figure out exactly what's making that noise. How do I fix it? You know, what, what is involved? Watch some YouTube videos, figure out what it's supposed to look like when it's done, and you do the work yourself. This hybrid publisher is taking it to a trusted mechanic. They're the one who will be able to listen to it, help you figure out what you need, get the car back in the condition that it needs to be so that uh, it's drivable and safe. They're gonna guide you through in terms of, all right, you may need to get your brakes checked and you know another 5,000 miles, whatever, but they're gonna give you all of the information that you need to make informed decisions about your book. When it comes to uh, the publishing, there are so many different options out there. And just like car mechanics, you've got those that are predatory and you've got those that are, are trustworthy and your friendly neighborhood garage mechanic. So you really wanna find those relationships that work well. We actually have a quiz that helps people determine which publishing model is right for them based on certain questions that we ask. You know, for instance, do you have a budget? Do you like to dig deep into learning new things? If you don't, then self-publishing, if you don't like digging deep to learn new things, self-publishing may not be the best option for you because there's a lot to learn. But you can have a ready-made team who can guide you through the process when you work with a trusted hybrid publisher, because what they're going to do is they already know what needs to be done. They're gonna tell you what your options are. They're going to give you the opportunity to provide feedback and input, but they're gonna guide you along the right path. And so what you're doing there is you're paying for this guidance, you're paying for these services rendered. Uh, your budget may need to be a little bit more than if you were publishing on your own, but if you're publishing self-publishing, you've still got to hire an editor, hire a cover designer, figure out all these, buy your ISBNs. And when you're buying ISBNs in smaller blocks, it's much more expensive than when you're buying them a hundred at a time. So, you know, there's all sorts of things that in the end, the cost between doing self-publishing well and working with a hybrid publisher may not be all that different. Uh, oh, that is absolutely my experience. Yep. Yeah. I mean, you're going to spend thousands upon thousands of dollars to properly publish a book. I mean, publishers spend, I mean, Random House spends $10,000 to properly put out a book. Yep. So why wouldn't you? Um, and they have, they have better uh, economics of scale than you do. Putting mm -hmm. a book out properly is no different than starting any other business. You have to be well-financed to do so. Yeah. Now, you have to decide um, how much of it you want to figure out how to do on your own. If you're going to be doing multiple books, if you want to be one of these rapid release folks who puts out 10 books a year, then learning how to do it yourself and self-publishing to keep those costs down is going to make a lot more sense than hiring a, a publisher to help you each time. You may want to hire a publisher the first time so they can guide you through the process, guide you through the steps so that then subsequent ones are easier for you to do. But that's my two cents. Well, I love your two cents. And Tara, thank you for jumping in. Uh, Jean is also asking because her book was with, I'm not going to mention the name of the company out loud, but her book was with a division of author solutions, which I will mention. It was a division. And I, I'm here to mention to you guys that there are companies out there like Balboa, like Alsons. There are companies that that say that they're a division of Hay House or say that they're a division of Simon & Schuster or say that they're 
the self-published arm of Zondervan mm -hmm. or Harper Collins, a Christian. They are, in a sense, but what they all are, they, they are actually just all owned by Author Solutions. And Author Solutions is a company that has partnered with these major houses like Hay House and Simon & Schuster, HarperCollins, Zondervan, to offer self-publishing services and self-publishing packages that is, in essence, just vanity publishing. They, they charge you three, four, five thousand dollars $5,000 to start. And then there's marketing and there's a bunch of stuff that goes on top of it. And they, and you as the author get to make most of the decisions that will usually end up with a very poorly published book in most cases, not at all. Not only that, it's also expensive to stay with them. Because oh, extremely the, expensive. If you look at the, the author copies, they typically do a 20% off list price, meaning that you're only getting a 20% discount to buy copies yourself, as opposed to a markup on print price. And so there are some other, book. yeah, keep in mind, keep on, you know, make sure that you Google any company you're planning on using. And um, I have no problem with author solutions. I don't, they, they, I mean, if you, if you want to use them, I, I'm not telling you not to, but they're not a hybrid publisher. They're not a self-publishing company. They are a vanity press and you, and they're a great option if you want to print a couple copies of your grandmother's cookbook. Um, but it's an extremely expensive option. They do not have um, they do not have the seal of approval from most of the industry for a good reason. And I'm just gonna and Jean, your your imprint is one of those. So um, and David is asking if a hybrid gets the rights. David, if you if you use a vanity press, they have the publishing rights and the distribution rights until you cancel the contract. Um, with a hybrid publisher, in most cases, the same thing is true. They have the publishing rights and the distribution rights, but what distribution rights? It depends on the publisher. It depends on your contract. But yes, in most cases, you are going to be giving up the distribution rights, but only until the contract is canceled or over. Tara, with you guys in Emerald Lake, what do you do about the rights? So in discussing things with our lawyer, what they said is you need to distinguish between rights and a license. So in our contract, the author maintains all of the rights and they license us to an exclusive license that allows us to publish and distribute. Fabulous. What that means is a lot of folks that are using their book to build a business, for instance, they don't lose any of their intellectual property rights or anything like that. Anything they want to do in relation to the book is still in their control. Tara, would you be willing to go to the chat box and drop in uh, the link to either your quiz or you were, you mentioned a quiz and a couple people are asking about it. Um, uh, the quiz can be found right on our homepage. I'll drop it in the chat box. That would be wonderful. And Tara, thank you for joining me. I'm sorry to put you on the spot like that. Always happy to help, Amy. All right. I'll talk to you later and I'll answer your question in a second. Okay. <laughs> All right. That was Tara. Um, uh, Tara is, uh, again, the, I believe she's the executive director of, of Emerald Lake Books. Uh, I like them. They're a, a good company. There's lots of great hybrid publishers out there. Uh, there's also a lot of horrible ones. So, um, again, paying attention to, uh, and I'd like to recommend Ally, A-L-L-I, the Alliance of Independent Authors, Orna Ross and her group are wonderful, wonderful at identifying. You should also go to Writer Beware, Editors and Predators, which I think is back up and running again, but Writer Beware, Victoria's list is terrific. Going to all those, so just Google them, guys. Uh, don't ask me for the links because I, 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 I told you I'm snarky, I've had no sleep, and I'm not doing well with multitasking. But just go type Victoria, uh, Writer Beware, Writers Beware, and you'll, you'll find it and Orna Ross, A-L-L-I. Both of those organizations are absolutely worth it. All right, an anonymous person is saying, draft to digital mandated a unique ISBN. Does the PCIP need to be updated through Donahue and also updated in the book? The answer is it depends. Did draft to digital mandate, mandate a unique ISBN for the EPUB? And did you not have that before? Did you have a, an ISBN just for all eBooks? Because now EPUBs and Kindles are, there's a new practice where they are suggesting that you, insisting that you have two different ISBNs. If draft to digital mandated a unique ISBN just for their distribution, 
Um, I'm confused by that because that doesn't make as much sense. I, I, I do not like the idea of you having an EPUB with two different ISBNs. But if your EPUB is one ISBN and your Kindle is another one, yes, the PCIP should be updated and it should be updated in your book. So I hope that answers that question. Tara's saying if you, now this is a very specific question for publishers who actually have the ability to get their CIP from the Library of Congress. And guys, that's 99% is not you. But for Tara, who has a real publishing house and, and she can go to the Library of Congress for her CIP, Tara, yes, you will be in the MARC database, you will be in the OCLC, you will be in all of them. Uh, they, do, they take care of all of that for you. And it's free. Yes, but unfortunately for most of us, including me, we're not eligible. The Library of Congress won't even consider taking you on for a CIP or doing the work for you until you publish a great many books by a number of different authors. All right, uh, Wendy's saying she has the Real Fast Library course but hasn't received any emails about libraries. Wendy, New Shelves sold a library package back in, I think it was November and December. It was a special deal that we ran where we would do mailings to the library market and then we gave people the choice between either doing it right then uh, or doing it in the spring and then COVID hit. So, uh, so there, there's no emails going out uh, about that. That was just something that we did at the end of the year. Randall is saying he accidentally signed up for ACX exclusive. How bad is that and how long is it in place for? Randall, in most cases, ACX exclusive is a seven-year deal. So you have signed a seven-year contract. But um, I would definitely suggest, uh, not suggest, I'm insisting um, that you go to ACX and you download the contract. And I want you to read that contract line by line. I want all of you guys to read the contracts you sign. I want you to read your contract with Kindle. I want you to read your contracts with Ingram Spark. You are running businesses. You should know before you sign a contract, what you're signing. Now, I am guilty of it myself. Every time I go onto Apple, every time I go onto my phone, I'm like, accept terms, accept terms. I don't even read them. But if you accidentally signed up for ACX, it's a seven-year exclusive deal for that book, Randall. And, and that's fine that you did it. I've done it myself by accident, but now you need to read the contract to find out if there's any way you can get out of it. Because there might be, who knows? Uh, let's see, Jean, you know, you can always call us. We'd be happy to help you redo your book. You, you can always, um, Wendy's saying if you paid for a narrator, it's only a year exclusive. So if you paid outright, uh, so guys, it depends on the contract. Um, uh, oh, and Randy's jumping in that says it's a seven year distribution, but only one year exclusive guys. I'm here to tell you all the contracts are different. Um, it, it depends on the contract because some people, they paid a certain amount and it was a seven year exclusive for everything. Other people paid a different amount or did it assigned a different deal with a producer and they are giving up 50% or even 75% of the profits, but in exchange. So everyone's contract, depending on what they signed and when it's a little different, I'm afraid. Lene is asking if I have any thoughts to share about ProQuest program about getting PDFs into libraries. I do. Absolutely do it if you can. Fill out their seven page application, upload your information, get your books, get your PDFs and your EPUBs. They also do EPUBs into ProQuest system, especially for your book, Lene. I mean, yes. Uh, if, if you're a nonfiction author, if you have any, any books that would be good in the academic world, in the corporate world, that would appeal to doctors, professors, any professionals of any ilk, run, do not walk to ProQuest and get your book signed up for their system. ProQuest, P-R-O-Q-U-E-S-T. Google it. You're going to love them. They're owned by Bowker, and I love their program. It's done a great job for some of my authors in getting their exposure way up and even made them a little bit of money at the end of the day. All right, it's a little after 11, but I have one more question. Sue asked a question and I really wanna to get to it. So I hope you guys are okay with that. Just stick around uh, and, and I'll make it worth your while. Uh, I don't know how I will make it worth, you know what? I'll make it worth your while, but I'll stop talking in a few minutes. Sue has a dilemma. She's focusing on two different books. One's a book, one's a workbook, both in her niche. One is more of a passion project about what's going on in her field, which could bring people into her email list, but the other would be directly related to her new coaching program, 
which could be used to bring people into the program. She can't do both right now. Right now, Sue, um, and I, I know a little bit about you and your program, so I feel comfortable saying this, with everything going on with the economy, with COVID, with politics, getting people onto your email list is key. Far more important, um, uh, do, working, focusing on the passion project and getting snippets out on social media and posting articles and, and, and taking content from your passion project and getting it out there and attracting people to your email list, that never goes away. And that email list can be used over the next decade. Uh, email's not going anywhere, I promise you, in the next few months, weeks, years. But your coaching problem, your coaching program, not problem, sorry, um, that it probably brings in a lot more money, but it's a real weird time right now. And people are having a hard time committing and to, to expending energy. And I think you'll have a much higher success rate focusing on getting your email list up and running. And then you can use that to promote your coaching problem. But if a program, did I mention I didn't sleep last night? Sue M. does not have a coaching problem. She has a coaching program. I have a coaching problem. All right, guys. So that's my two cents. Sue, I know you. I know your book. If it were me, um, I would definitely work right now on building your email list. It's a better use of your time, and I think you'll be more successful at it. All right. I'm checking the chat box real quick. It looks like everyone's just saying thanks and goodbye. I don't see any other questions. Wait, one person. Oh, Sue's saying thanks. All right. We did it. Guys, we nailed it. I stayed awake. I got through in an hour and five minutes. I got all your questions answered. I am going to celebrate with a nap. I adore you. We will see you back here next Friday, 10 a.m. Eastern at Free Advice Fridays. Please go to freeadvicefridays.com. I am begging you. Sign up to and subscribe to our new YouTube channel. It would totally help me out. And if you would, would you share the freeadvicefridays.com link on Facebook or Twitter? If you enjoy this, I would love to get a little more love because now that we're branding with Free Advice Fridays, I'd love to move some of the love away from Amy Collins and onto Free Advice Fridays. That came out wrong. I'll see you guys next week and I really adore you. We'll see you Friday at Free Advice Fridays.